Hi, I'd like to tell you about a further important theorem with Martingales called dupe sub martingale inequality. dupe sub martingale inequality is about sub martingales, so let Z be a non negative sub martingale. So let me just remind you what the what sub martingales are. So those are the ones which are non decreasing in conditional expectation. Okay, super martingales were non increasing in conditional expectations, sub martingales are non decreasing in conditional expectations, and martingales are constant in conditional expectations. So then <coughs> fix uh, any positive real number, not random, any positive C. We have the following, and I'm going to write this up in a funny way. I'm going to just start off with ZK. Uh, larger than or equal to C and it's going to be smaller than or equal to E of ZN N over C so that doesn't make any sense at the moment but I just want to emphasize that if this was N then this would just be Markov's inequality okay if this was here ZN larger than C smaller than or equal to E of ZN over C Z is non negative this would just be Markov's inequality. The sub martingale inequality is stronger because I able to put here a supremum, the largest of everybody up to n. Probability that that's larger than c is bounded by this kind of Markov type bound on the last member of the of the uh, martingale sequence I'm looking at. Okay, so the largest of largest of the z up to n probability that that that's uh, at least c is bounded by the mean of the last one over c okay i am actually going to prove something slightly stronger but it's uh, often not very much used i'm actually going to put here zn on the event that the supremum of k uh, uh, yeah supremum in k of zk is larger than equal to c Okay, so that is going to be the thing I prove. It's clear that uh, this is an indicator and that is not negative. So this is clearly bounded by that as soon as I put down the over C, which I forgot. Sorry for that. Okay, so, so it's clear that if I forget about this indicator, then I'm just making the whole thing larger because that is not negative. So this bound is clearly bounding that. I'm going to prove that this probability is bounded by this expectation here. Okay, so let's do that. And the way to do this is just breaking up the event, which we see on the left hand side. So the proof is going to be following, define exactly this event here, that the supremum up to n of zk is at least C, so that's an event, call it F, and I'm going to def uh, I'm going to break this up according to the first instance that I'm going above C. Um, so I'm going to break it up into a union where the F's are defined as follow. So F not is going to the be the event that already Z not reach level C and for K larger than zero so for positive case FK is going to be the event that none of the previous ones before K reach level C so ZI is smaller than C for every I up to K but then on the I's term ZK is actually reaching level C okay so that's gonna be that's gonna be my definition of F naught and FK all right essentially what I'm doing here is if one of these people is at least C I'm looking at the first instance where that happens it could happen at F0 or it could happen at FK first and all the other ones are below C before K right uh, just a small remark, I am using supremum because this theorem generalizes to continuous time when you really do need to use supremums, but in fact it's just the supremum of finite limit terms, so I could as well write here maximums for the discrete case. 
Uh, traditionally, we write it as supremum because it's true in continuous time. But for this discrete setup we have in this unit, I could easily just replace this by maximums. And uh, that makes maybe it's even easier to, to understand that this is just the uh, union of finitely many things. Now, moreover, this union is a disjoint union. So these guys here are disjoint because there can only be one instance when you first reach level C. Okay, it cannot happen that you, level, you, you reach level C at F0, at, at, the, at the, the zeros index, and also at the fifth index. Or you first reach level C at the fifth instance, and uh, the fifth instance, and also the seventh instance. That cannot happen, right? So these guys are exclusive. F0 and all the FKs together are disjoint or exclusive events. So this is a disjoint union, and that immediately implies that the indicator of f is just going to be the sum of the indicators of the fk's because the indicator of the fk's at most one of these can be one all of the others must be zero and if if one of these is one that exactly means that the event f occurs so then the left hand side is also one okay so that, that just follows from being a disjoint union okay and once we had all that then the proof is now Quite straightforward. Take the expectation of Zn on Fk, and notice that by the Sub-Martingale inequality or Sub-Martingale property, sorry, Sub-Martingale property, this is larger than or equal than the expectation of Zk over Fk. To prove that, you can use a conditional expectation given. Fk. So given the filtration up to k, it's easy to easy to see that this is the case. I'm not going to detail that. Homework, do it. And then notice that under Fk, Fk is a, a complicated event, but either for F0 or for Fk, it includes the fact that Zk is at least c. So when this indicator is 1, then we know that Zk is at least c. And therefore, this is larger than or equal to the expectation of C on Fk. C is a constant. I can factor it out. It's not random. And the expectation of the indicator becomes the probability of the event Fk. All I need to do now is to sum these things up. So if I do on both sides a sum from 0 to n, then on the left-hand side, I can factor out the expectation of Zn, and I'm left with uh, I'm left with the sum of the indicators of the fk's, which is the indicator of f. So this becomes f after summing. On the right-hand side, I have the uh, c constant times the sum of the probabilities of the fk's, but because these guys were disjoint, the sum of the probabilities is the probability of the union, so I end up with the probability of the event f. And if you look carefully, the f event, uh, zn on f, the event f is exactly that the supremum of the zk is at least c, so that's exactly the event f. I have the expectation of Zn on that event, so uh, this part here is exactly that part there. And uh, if I divide by the constant C, then on the, the other side I have the probability of F, and F was exactly this same event there. So that's my left hand side here, and I'm done with the proof. Now, this was a uh, Okay, this was sub the sub martingale inequality. Here's a remark. Here's a remark. How often do you see do we see sub martingales? How often do we see sub martingales? So let me put a remark here. What is a, a natural way of producing sub martingales? If g is convex, a function is convex from real to real and the expectation of the mode of uh, the mode of g of m is finite 
and M is a martingale. Then it follows that G of M is a sub-martingale. Is a sub-martingale. Sub-martingale. Okay, sorry, there is not much space here. So if you have a martingale, you apply a convex function of it, which still has finite mean, then what you get is a sub-martingale. Why is that? Well, it's just a, a, a Jensen's inequality. So if you look at the expectation of g of m n plus 1 given f n, Jensen's inequality tells you that this is larger than or equal to g of the condition expectation. All right? That's just Jensen's inequality on condition expectation. So uh, expectation of a convex function is larger than or equal than the convex function of the expectation. But then m was a martingale, so that's just by definition g of m n. And so you have the martingale property. And of course you have the L1 property here, and of course it's adapted as before. So that shows that if you have a martingale and you take a convex function of it, it becomes a sub-martingale. If the convex function is, more, is further more uh, non-negative, then you immediately satisfy the conditions of the sub-martingale inequality because now you have a non-negative sub-martingale and then everything works. So what is the most natural way of producing a non-negative convex function of any martingale? The nicest non-negative convex function which people more of, most often use is, of course, the square function. So if you have an L2 martingale and you take the square of it, that's going to be non-negative and it's going to be a sub-martingale and then you can apply the sub-martingale inequality. So very often you'll see taking the square of a martingale and do a sub-martingale inequality there. Another example is exponential of mn, assuming that it's still finite mean. That's again a non-negative convex function of a martingale and you can apply dupe sub-martingale inequality on that.